Okay. The following interview was conducted with, Pres with Stephen C. Baring, President Emeritus of Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Project. It took place on Wednesday, November 15th, 2006 at his office in the Purdue Memorial Union. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early life, and parents and siblings. Um, I was born in Berlin, Germany in 1932, and I was the first of two sons in a merchant family in uh, both Berlin and Hamburg. They split their activities between those two fabulous cities. Uh, my father was in the furniture business and was the marketing manager for this international corporation called Tonet, T-H-O-N-E-T, based, uh, headquartered at that time and I believe still in Vienna. And uh, he traveled extensively, which in the 30s was a major undertaking. You couldn't go to the airport and book a flight to, <laughs> to some important place like we do nowadays, and he would drive and uh, take a train and whatnot. And I remember as a child that he would get ready and uh, uh, be gone for a week or two while he did that. Uh, my mother was uh, the only daughter of another merchant family. They were in the department store business and ladies ready to wear. And uh, uh, she uh, uh, was very artistic. Uh, she wrote children's stories and she illustrated them herself. And she was uh, 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 really a remarkable role model for me. She spoke many languages and uh, later on uh, was my home school teacher because uh, during the Second World War, I missed five years of school. And if it hadn't been for her, I don't think I would have made it to college and all the other things that followed. What was your date of birth? When you were born? The 20th of August, 1932. Can you tell why you missed, this is World War II, you, why you missed school, schools were closed? Well, uh, uh, World War II uh, began uh, uh, when I was in first grade. And uh, uh, we had moved to Hamburg from uh, Berlin because the grandparents lived there. And also my father's business took him there. He became the manager of the operation in Hamburg. And uh, we, uh, in, in due course, uh, were victims a few years later of the famous uh, British air raid on Hamburg, which took four days and leveled the city. And my father was in Berlin at the time, and we thought he was killed in Berlin, and he thought we were killed in Hamburg. We didn't see each other for the next number of years. Uh, we lost everything, all of our possessions, and my mother and my younger brother, he's four years younger than I, uh, were transported to southern Germany in uh, Bavaria, where we were in a displaced persons camp doing farm labor, uh, which uh, came in very handy many years later when I was at Purdue and we had a contest between the presidents of IU and Purdue and the governor and lieutenant governor to see who could milk the most milk in a short period of time. The other three gentlemen had never seen the underside of a cow except in the movies, and I filled that bucket in no time flat because I had that experience. <laughs> so everything helps. Yeah. Did you go to your grade school and high school was also in Germany? Yeah, grade school initially Berlin and then Hamburg, okay. and then during the war years I didn't go to school. Uh, when the war was over, through the offices of my grandparents, who at that time lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, having moved there from New York, uh, the Red Cross found us in this uh, displaced persons camp, and they also found my father, who was uh, uh, working at that time in Hamburg again, but thought we had been killed years before, and brought us together, and that was quite a reunion. Uh, he came. Okay. Uh, to Bavaria, and of course this was just after the war in the late 1945, and uh, he had uh, not seen us and we hadn't seen him for all those years, and uh, uh, we didn't recognize him, and I expect he didn't recognize us either. But uh, following that, we uh, booked passage on a, on a truck to get back to Hamburg, and it was interesting Hamburg was and is a Hanseatic League city, which is separate from Germany. It's, a, it's an entity in its own. And you had to show proof that you were a citizen of Hamburg or they wouldn't let you back in. Well, we had uh, identity papers that made that possible. So we came back to Hamburg 
and we lived on an island across from the city of Hamburg, across from the Elbe River. And I tried to go back to school and my father interceded uh, with the local school and I was at that point, uh, let's see, I was about 14 years old and had missed five years of school and uh, uh, went to see the principal of the local school where kids that age would go. And uh, I remember this quite vividly today. He was told and I was told that uh, there was absolutely no chance that I could get into that school and matriculate as a student because I'd missed too much uh, of the instruction and I would be flunked out if I attempted it and uh, so I ought to go and learn a trade. Uh, but I was uh, even then imbued with the notion of doing something for humanity and I wanted to study medicine. And the principal, Dr. Nikolai, I remember him like it happened yesterday, uh, said, you must be kidding. Study medicine and you've not had any school? And I said, won't you please give me a chance and I'll do whatever it takes to uh, become a good student here. There was a gymnasium in a suburb of Hamburg called Blankenese. I visited there again many, many years later after I was at Purdue, as a matter of fact. And it's still there. Uh, at any rate, uh, with the help of my mother and all of her talents, I would take home the daily assignments and we would spend hours every evening she drilled me in French, she drilled me in uh, uh, English and uh, in uh, the various other subjects that were at that point uh, in the curriculum and I went and I passed all the exams. By the time I finished there I was first in the class which is the great honor that you have in European schools like we would celebrate uh, athletes here. If you're the primus, the Latin term for first, they carry you around on your shoulders, uh, on their shoulders, and uh, celebrate the fact that you made number one in the class. And uh, you've heard that, I'm, I'm sure, about English schools too, when you get a first in some subject, when you're the best. Uh, I didn't think anything of it because I'd made that determination. I was going to succeed. Years later, Nikolai came to Pittsburgh when I was uh, a medical student there, and he happened to have a meeting in America and he and my Latin professor, also English professor, a fellow by the name of Plefka, uh, were together and had found out where I lived and called and uh, said, could they take me to lunch? And uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever had in my life was when Nikolai said, you know, when you came and you said you were going to make it after missing school all those years, I knew there was something special about you. And by golly, you've made it and we're very proud of you. It's the only other time I've seen them, and I'm sure by now they're no longer around, but it, it was a special school and special people. Mm -hmm. Then you immigrated, how did, then you came to the United States? Yeah, after, after a number of years there in Hamburg, after the war, uh, we had lots of relatives then and now in England, and uh, we couldn't come to the United States, even though my grandparents uh, on my mother's side had been in New York and Pittsburgh for many, many years, and my father's family had actually emigrated under the Lincoln Homestead Act in the 1870s, and they are still today in Botno, North Dakota. It's a marvelous story, and in fact, uh, my great aunt Anna was interviewed by James Michener for his fabulous book, Centennial, and I had a chance to meet her in 1949 when she was in her 90s, and she told the story as a young girl coming to America and meeting her husband who also had come to America uh, from Austria and uh, from Bavaria and how they had uh, uh, staked out the land. They didn't realize half of it was in Saskatchewan, Canada. They didn't realize it until the 40s when my father helped them sort this out for tax purposes. Uh, at any rate, uh, she told the story of what it takes to be a real community, a real town, a real city, and she made the statement that it was their ambition to have a town with a railway station, not just a saloon and a general store, but a railway station. And then she added with a twinkle to Michener, today you would say an airport. <laughs> he has that in his book, it's a charming part of the book, and it was even more wonderful to actually meet this lady. It's the only time I saw her was when we visited up there. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I know you went to graduate from Pitt Medical School, and you had said earlier that you sort of had an interest in medicine, and that's the reason after you finished college you went to medical school there. Yeah, first we were in England for a couple of years, uh -huh. and uh, while on, on the way to America in those days there was no way to get here, and we stayed with relatives there in London, and I again missed school. I was not able to get to school there, nor work there. And uh, we, uh, actually, I, I moonlighted a little bit with BBC, and we did a program called Mr. B and Mrs. B and the Little Daughter C uh, for Radio Free Europe, which was interesting, teaching English to European countries. I stayed with my cousin, whose name was Frederick Falk, V-A-L-K, who was in the 40s a very famous Shakespearean actor. And uh, one weekend he said, can you uh, come and join us for dinner Friday evening? I have some of my students in. And I got to sit next to a chap whose name was, uh, uh, I'm blocked on his name now. <laughs> It'll come, it'll, come to me. it'll come to me in just a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, at any rate, uh, he later on became a very famous Shakespearean actor, and uh, I met all kinds of interesting people there during that time. And then we came from there to Pittsburgh. I see. That was an interesting experience, and you know, there's a lot of Shakespeare and I visited around in that area. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, after you got your degree, you sort of uh, did some other things before you joined the IU Medical Center. You were involved in some of the early space I, I joined the Air Force because I was poor as a church mouse, and uh, I wanted to go After you on. After your degree, you joined the Air Force? Yeah, even before. I, I joined when I was a senior in medical school because I kept getting called up every six months to have a physical to be drafted. In those days, uh, in the 50s, if you didn't keep your grades up, you were in the service, just like that, in the Army. And so after I had been there a number of times, I said to the gentleman there, I said, what, what can I do not to have to come and have a physical all the time? And the guy said, well, uh, you can uh, uh, sign up now and volunteer for one of the services, and then you'll owe four years instead of two, but you'll be out of this hassle. So I signed up for the Air Force Medical Corps as a senior in medical school, and that turned out to be a very fortuitous decision because, uh, first of all, after medical school, they allowed me to uh, uh, choose where I wanted to go for my graduate education. And I chose Walter Reed Hospital, which is ph phenomenal. And unfortunately, it's being closed now and merged with uh, Bethesda Navy. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, while I, when I finished with that, uh, I was... Uh, uh, later on assigned, I specialized in internal medicine and endocrinology, and I was assigned as uh, head of medicine for the Air Force's major referral hospital, the Walter Reed counterpart in San Antonio, Texas. And in those days it was called Lackland Air Force Base, later Wilford Hall Medical Center. And uh, uh, during that time I came to the attention of General Bernard Schriever, who was then forming NASA and getting ready to send a man to the moon. And he called me one day and he said, can you come to Houston in civilian clothing and uh, uh, let me talk about a special assignment we have in mind for you. And I got there and there were two other doctors who later on became dear friends, of course, and we all agreed to join him in this endeavor. And he said, you can't tell anyone, not even your wife. And we walked out of there and we said, uh, who would we tell? They wouldn't believe it. This man is out of his mind. Send a man to the moon? This was back in 19, uh, let's see when that might have been, uh, 60, I think. 60, maybe, yeah, 60, it was 1960. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started to work on that uh, part time and at night and on weekends and in the summer and uh, always in civilian clothing and always secret. And uh, I would come home uh, in the middle of winter with a suntan because we'd been somewhere to train. We helped select the first seven astronauts, and then the next group, and I became very close friends with most of the early astronauts. And to this day, Neil Armstrong is like a brother to me, our first man on the moon. And I paid no attention to where these people had gone to college, by the way. So when I came to Purdue uh, years later, one day our alumni wanted to have uh, an astronaut or two for homecoming. and. Uh, uh, Joe Rudolph, who was our alumni director at the time, said, would you be willing to invite an astronaut? I said, why, yes. I said, whom would you like to invite? And he said, well, did you know that the first man and the last man on the moon are Purdue alums? I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, I know who they are, but I didn't know they were Purdue alums. 
And I said, well, let's invite both of them. He said, well, how can we get that done? I said, I'll call them. I know them personally. <laughs> so it turns out I invited all of the then Purdue astronauts. I got a list and we had 22 at that time. We have a good many more now. And uh, they all came. Uh, I think because they knew who I was, you know, there was this connectivity. And I invited them and their wives, and uh, we had the most glorious weekend here. We had them all on the football field, and you may have pictures of that when they were here. And they had the best time, as did the rest of us. Right. So uh, because of that uh, experience with the astronaut program, and also my being chief of the medical program there, uh, I stayed in for a sum total of 14 years. And then at the end of that time, they wanted to assign me to Washington and uh, in the Surgeon General's office. And I came home and told Jane, I said, you know, I'm not going to go into administration. That's the last thing I want to do. I want to continue with medical practice and endocrinology and research and teaching and so on. And uh, I've, had, I've done my duty. I have filled, uh, fulfilled my obligation. And uh, I'm going to resign. And I had an offer at that time from Indiana University School of Medicine. An old friend of mine had been head of medicine there, and that was in 1968. And I came uh, to the IU Medical Center as professor of medicine and assistant dean. Three years later, I was dean of the school, so much for not doing administration. <laughs> I did that for, uh, I was in Indianapolis, some total of 14 years. Mm -hmm. And then Fred Andrews and John Hicks and Don Powers and a whole bunch of others whom I had gotten to know because I'd started this uh, medical program here, which is still flourishing, and around the state, uh, Notre Dame and elsewhere, uh, came to see me and said, we have had a failed search. We would like to ask you to consider being president of Purdue. And I said, that's just insane. I said, it's ridiculous. A doctor from IU? at Purdue with all those engineers. My number two son was then an engineering student here, and he called me later that week. I don't know which of those folks put him up to that. I think Fred Andrews. And he says, you got us all wrong. We Boilermakers are really terrific people, and you ought to give that a second thought. <laughs> well, I did, and the rest is history. I, I must tell you that of all the decisions that have been presented to me, over the many years uh, that I've been uh, working, there is none that has been more fulfilling and more rewarding than coming to Purdue. And uh, that was uh, in February the 4th, 19, uh, 1969. Yeah. Is that right? 82. 1982. 1982. It was. February the 4th, 1983, I came here. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, but you met your wife while you were in Pittsburgh. She went to the same the same. School. Yeah, I met her her first day of school. I was a year ahead of her, and her sister was a classmate of mine. At, at the university? University of Pittsburgh. And she came in for lunch that first week that she was there. And her sister introduced me, and I, I thought the Lord had sent me this gorgeous blonde. She's coming down the hall right toward me. And <laughs> no idea that she would one day be my wife. And... Uh, uh, she was coming to see her sister, of course, and she introduced us as, as a matter of courtesy. I didn't see her again for several years, actually. And uh, then one day we had a girl ask boy Sadie Hawkins dance, and uh, her sister said to me, we had classes together all the time, and she said, how would you like to double date with Jim and me and my sister Jane? I said, who's your sister Jane? Oh, you met her first day of school here. I said, oh, the blonde bombshell, as she was known thereabouts. She, she was quite a, quite a good-looking young lady and very capable, very bright. I said, uh, yeah, if she'll call me, I'll do that. So that was uh, uh, the first and last time that we ever went out with anyone else. <laughs> We've been together. Uh, we'll be married 50 years uh, next month, oh, nice. December 27th. One thing I wanted to ask you, um, we heard about this very Best Teacher Award that's given to uh, the outstanding interns at IU. Do you know, who, uh, are you aware of that one? Sure. Oh, tell us a little bit about uh, it. When the I reason that I know about that is because I heard about it, and, and I've done, I did some research before the interview, uh -huh. but it wasn't, you know, really mentioned, and one of the people that got that award 
is that Dr. Whalen, he's a urologist, uh -huh. and a friend of mine goes to him, and he had the plaque in his office. That's where we first heard about it. Uh, there are a number of awards uh, named for me at the medical school, yeah. and, and the most most significant one is the the uh, Bering uh, Prize for uh, uh, outstanding research in the health sciences, and it's been given now ever since uh, about 24 years now, one a year, and. Most of those people have also got Nobel Prizes, so it's that level person that they have chosen. And I don't know that, that that's not the one that Waylon no, has. He no, has the Best got, Teacher this Award. Is, this okay. is a teaching in, for, out for interns, and so that's the one that yeah. he had gotten. Okay. Uh, and when he was, because he did some hospital work there, and that's why the plaque, okay. and that's where he first uh, That's great, I'm glad yeah, to hear that. So very nice. Then now you're, uh, this is interesting, you said when this is your third career. Your first was the doctor, the second was the medical education administrator, and the third was the university president. Right. I think that's really good. Um, now you told us a little bit how, how you came about. How about the first year when your theme was Touching Tomorrow Today? How did you happen to come up with that theme? Well, I've always been future-oriented, and I've always thought that uh, what we needed to do was uh, the University of Pittsburgh motto, by the way, is Labore ad Astra, work toward the stars. And I've always remembered that. It's kind of uh, incorporated itself into my thinking, that sure. the notion of, of reaching beyond yourself. And uh, uh, so this touching tomorrow today is uh, sort of uh, a takeoff on that, plus the work with the astronauts. I, I mean, that is such a mind-expanding experience to work with people like that who have never heard the word impossible, who have never said no to any uh, challenge, and uh, who always work together. There is no competition there, at least there wasn't when I was involved. Uh, people were just uh, all too eager to get the job done and to work jointly at uh, achieving the goal that we were striving for at that time. And of course that business of stepping on the moon was just so extraordinary. Have you seen the new biography on Neil Armstrong? The one that the man came and talked about? He, um, yeah, he came, he, uh, that's he came, right, that's he, right. He came, it's a very good book, it yeah. really is. And uh, it's a little long because he left nothing out, you know, and in fact when I was interviewed by him I said, now uh, you ought to uh, hit the highlight themes and not uh, get lost in the, in the shrubbery of life. <laughs> As Neil is an extraordinary individual, he really is. And, you know, the space program, you were involved in it when, when Kennedy said we got to put him in. How did that make any change in the focus on the uh, space program? When Kennedy became involved, yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was in fact in Houston uh, with with General Schriever and maybe thirty people in the room when Kennedy visited us for an entire day. It was uh, one of the most magic experiences ever. This man was so profoundly brilliant. He could ask the most searching, probing, and intelligent questions I've ever heard from anyone, and then engage in a conversation as he got the answers, you know, and, and, and get into depth about details. Uh, he was uh, equally at ease with a Carl Sagan about the cosmos, with an astronaut about flying, with a physician about medicine. And we were just absolutely spellbound by this gentleman, and he was our president at the time. We would have walked through the wall for him if he had only asked, you know, whatever he wanted to do. And when he wound up the day and he shook hands with everybody and hugged people and uh, said, now I'm there for you. You can call me any time of day or night. I will do what I can from the White House to help you with this project. And yes, we want to put a man on the moon. And uh, we, we walked out of there and we said, we're going to do that. And he's going to help us. That was just perfect then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's I'm gonna talk a little bit about some university group and activities. I'll start with the students. That the Bering Years has that quote, there's not a day goes by that I won't talk to the students. Tell us a little bit about your interaction and uh, you know, work with the students and just in kind of general. Well, uh, I've always done that the, in medicine as well as here and I, I was uh, on the faculty here in the School of Pharmacy and I had uh, uh, graduate students here and helped them with uh, with thesis research, uh, that's one kind of involvement, very intense involvement. Uh, less intense involvement would be to speak to a class or to a small group uh, or to get involved in uh, activities like uh, mortarboard, uh, uh, old masters, one of my favorites indeed, uh, uh, 
the fraternity I joined here, which was Kappa Sigma, a tremendous group, and uh, all the many honoraries that we have here, each of which has a special uh, place in my heart. Uh, the athletes, I, I'm just extraordinarily impressed by the extra commitment that it takes to be a varsity athlete and still be a Purdue student because this school is so hard, it is so difficult, no matter what your subject is, it's so intense. And then to also have a job, which is what it is to be a varsity athlete, and to practice and to travel and so on. And one of the most significant years that uh, I can recall here is when our women won the national championship. And my wife is a great sports fan as well. By the way, she, as you will find out, is a very educated lady, Phi Beta Kappa in her own right. Uh, she, uh, is, uh, she was just totally involved with the women's uh, uh, program in basketball and she said to me now you've got to promise us not promise me but promise us which was the team and the coaches and her and the students of course that you will come to all of our games this year we're headed for the national championship and I said you gotta be smoking <laughs> something we, we're not ready for that yes we are and well she says you've got to come to every game and with the schedule that the presidency requires of you, that's really difficult to achieve. And I would be in Washington doing something and rush back and come to a game. When we got into the, into the final stretch that year, and the games weren't here. They were all over the place. And finally I arrived in California when we played the, uh, the championship game. And I was late. I didn't get there till the, I think it was the second half. And we made it. And when the game was over, Stephanie White, who hurt herself that game, you may remember that story, uh, was helped by her teammates to climb up on the ladder and cut down the net. And she hobbled over and gave Jane and me the net. It was better than an honorary degree. It was absolutely astounding. What an emotion. What a feeling. And we felt like we were part of that team. And we were. And you were. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Time. I'm remembering, oh, good time to take. you know, I had, uh, had an honor uh, some months ago now where the athletes voted me into the Purdue Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, that, that is a highly significant gesture and by I, the students. And I'll tell you, I have seen the picture. Are you taking it? Okay, wait, just wait one sec. Sure. Um, one of the PK. Um, well, talk about a little bit about the scholarship, the Stephen C. Bering scholarships, how they came about, and uh, I know you may be very involved. Are you involved also in the, in the selection of the... Selection? No, I've never been in the selection process. How did they originally start? How did this start? Very well, well I did, of. it's of course an extraordinary uh, thing to be a Bering scholar. Uh, it started out as the Presidential Honor Scholars. Because uh, I had that kind of scholarship when I was an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh. It was called the Mellon Scholarship. And I can tell you a cute story about that. Uh, they only gave one a year. That's the Mellon family? Uh, that came from, from the Mellon Bank, the Mellon, Mellon Foundation. Bank. Mellon Foundation. And they gave one a year. And since I had been an immigrant and I had really nothing, if it hadn't been for scholarships, I couldn't have gone through school. And uh, the... Uh, uh, so I, I was selected to be the Mellon Scholar, and I, uh, I had other scholarships too, but that one is very memorable because it paid everything, plus a stipend and books and so on. And years later, when I was uh, elected to the Board of Trustees of the University of Pittsburgh, a retired trustee uh, who had been president of the Mellon Bank when I got that scholarship came to that meeting, and he said, I've been wanting to meet you because once in a while, one of the Mellon scholars made it big. <laughs> I said, who would that be? He said, well, you, of course. <laughs> now, I remember when you were selected. And I said, well, I'm just so flattered that you would remember. And uh, I'm honored to be a trustee. And I'm so pleased you're here today. And I've seen him a number of times since I've been on that board eight years now. Very in a small world. <laughs> so anyway, because of that experience, I had uh, proposed to the trustees here early on that in a university like ours with a heavy emphasis on science and mathematics and technology and engineering, uh, we ought to uh, uh, celebrate people who were broadly gauged 
and who had uh, a cosmopolitan interest in life and the arts and uh, in knowledge uh, for knowledge's sake and that we ought to try to find the best and the brightest and make it possible for them regardless of their personal means or family means to go through school here and that furthermore we ought to make it possible for them not just to get a bachelor's degree but to get a master's and a PhD and perhaps an MD degree if they were interested in biomedical engineering, biomedical informatics and things like that. And I had uh, early on when we started the scholarship, uh, I had thought that biomedical engineering was a natural for us. We didn't have that then. Mm -hmm. And we started that. And a lot of things we didn't have when I started here. We, we didn't have a, a school of liberal arts per se. And we didn't have uh, we just didn't have the comprehensive university approach that I felt was so absolutely integral to developing the complete capability of humankind. So the trustee said, well, that's great. What do you want to call that? And how are we going to do that? And I said, well, I'll put money into it myself. And I'm going to invite people to help underwrite that, foundations, individuals, and whatnot. And we've raised millions and millions of dollars for that scholarship program, initially called the Presidential Honor Scholarship. And then the trustees, after this took off, were so pleased with that that they asked me one day if I would mind if they named it in my name and then in Jane's name as well. So I uh, put some more money in to have a Jane Beering scholarship, and I wanted to help support that as well. And, you know, one of the sidebars to that, which has been so immensely thrilling, uh, it happened just recently. I had a phone call from a young woman here who said, I have just come back to Purdue. I uh, earned my PhD on the East Coast, and uh, I'm a Beering Scholar, and I'm now on the faculty at CFS, and I would like to come and have, have you for lunch over at the John Purdue Room, and I'd like to tell you about what's happened since I left Purdue. And uh, I, I just was so thrilled that I had that opportunity. There have been many like that. I've lost track how many dozens of youngsters have been through that program. They've all been terrific. The greatest disappointment was a young woman who became a chemical engineer and six weeks before graduation she called me and she said, I'm going to resign the Beering Scholarship and I'm going to resign from school and I'm getting married to a missionary and we're leaving for Africa. And uh, I said, can't you wait six weeks? And can't you go through commencement and let us finish off your degree? She said, no, we, we've got to go this week. She left and never came back. Oh, my goodness. You and you get together with them there? Uh, what? I meet with them once a semester. Mm -hmm. We have lunch, sometimes dinner. I also uh, have uh, gotten to know many of them uh, quite intimately and offer to write them letters of reference because uh, I get to know them well over the years. and. Uh, a good many have gone on to medical school and uh, at IU. Uh, there are half a dozen of them there right now with PhD, MD programs in physiology or in engineering and biomedical engineering and whatnot. And uh, a number of them have married each other because they've met in the program. And uh, there's one young man who works with NASA and his wife is a professor of biomedical engineering at Rice University in uh, Texas and we've been to their wedding and uh, uh, baptisms of the first or second child, I forget which one. And, and so we've stayed in touch and we exchange letters and pictures and whatnot. It's been a special group within a group. All right. Is there a limit each year on how many? Uh, Depends on how much money is available. Oh, okay. Five or six usually a year. Okay. But so the interaction just means so much. Do some of them continue graduate school here? Yes. Well? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. It's a totally open what they want to do. Okay. And uh, uh, this guy who went to Texas uh, with NASA and his wife is at Rice, uh, after they had been here, uh, I was in London one time on business, and I knew that uh, uh, the the young man was at Oxford at that point. And I said, I'm going to London, not far from Oxford. Would you come into London? Let's have dinner together. And he said, can I bring a friend? And he brought his then fiance, and uh, also a Purdue student. And uh, that was extremely special. Oh, yes, I would imagine, right. Yeah. So. Let's talk a little bit about the physical plant, brick by brick. You really 
arrange sort of a master plan with all the new <laughs> buildings that were added. Did, that sort of falls into what you're talking about, expanding the various schools. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the disappointing aspects of, of planning a university physically is that it takes so long. For example, right now, as I just drove in, uh, as you know, I was up for a hospital board meeting in Munster just now, and uh, came down Northwestern Avenue and passed by our newest building, the Armstrong Hall for Engineering. I started that seven years ago. Oh and it is only now, uh, you know, it was just topped off, and it's now being outfitted on the inside, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to dedicate that building and uh, uh, open it up next year in 07. Uh, Neil Armstrong is going to be here. We're going to have a statue of him as a student in front of the building and have a nice painting of him on the inside. And uh, he has given to us, by the way, all of his NASA memorabilia, which will be exhibited in that building. Is there going to be a display area? Yeah, there? yeah, okay. yeah. And he's excited about that. He's a very private man, as you have read. He doesn't like to be uh, paraded about and he doesn't brag about himself, and uh, it took me a while to persuade him that we needed a building named for him and to honor engineering and to honor his extraordinary achievements, first man on the moon and so on, but that's not all. I mean, he's a, a brilliant engineer and a professor, and uh, uh, he and I founded a company together in aerospace engineering years ago, which we since sold, and that was that. But. Uh, he, he's just a, a wonderful human being. And so I said, we want to do that. We want to honor you and in turn, you know, let us put your name on this building. So he agreed to do that. And he hasn't agreed to very many of those kinds of honors. Mm -hmm. I think, remember the author that was here on that book, it, he doesn't really have many writings and it took a little bit of time for him to, and yeah. he had exclusive, and yeah. the book is excellent. It was yeah. really it's quite a book. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, uh, he gave a very good talk when he came here for the I library. don't have one here, as a matter of fact. I have, I have it at home in my yeah. library uh -huh. there. Okay. You know, Kirk, there's a couple other things. You've got, I, I always think, the uh, bell tower, but there's been so many new buildings. But it does, as you say, it takes a lot of time. Bell tower. It's a yeah. great story. Okay. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, the smokestack across from there. And the bricks kept falling off the smokestack. And I was terribly concerned that someone would literally get killed by a smokestack brick coming down as you walk by the smokestack. And uh, the emotions about that were running high. And so Fred Ford and I said, we're going to have to tear this down in the middle of the night on a weekend, and then it's gone. It, it's going to have to be an all-night effort. We'll tear it down, and then we're going to have to have something ready to put up in its place. At that time, I was interested in getting the various reunion classes for their 50th reunion to sponsor something that would be significant for the university. And it was the class of 1948, Bob Jesse's class, who was then uh, vice chairman of the board with Don Powers. Uh, I talked to him about it. I said, how do you think the class of 48 would react to building a real monument to Purdue instead of the smokestack, something that rises high like a bell tower? And he said, why a bell tower? I said, well, I'll tell you. I just happened to find the original Hevelon Hall bells. Did you know they were lost for years and years? They were in a warehouse across the river in Lafayette. And one of our old hands in physical plant knew that I was looking for him. And he called me one day. And I said, I will come right now. I interrupted a meeting. I said, let's go into your truck and go over and find these bells. Well, they were wrapped in, uh, in burlap bags and in boxes, and they were like brand new. They were fabulous. So we had them shipped back to Philadelphia to the original place where they were made, the same place that made the Liberty Bell. And, uh, Good choice. Yeah, how about that? So uh, these people got all excited about these bells having been found again, and they checked them over, and they said they, they can be used, they can be hung again. They recommended that we not uh, swing them but that we have the clapper moved to activate them, and they, they felt that way they could last forever. And uh, we then got uh, the class of 48 together. We raised uh, millions of dollars. This was a very expensive project. And uh, we got the local construction firm here, did so many of our buildings, to put it up. And uh, the rest is history. It's a gorgeous uh, uh, keepsake forever. 
Well, it's nice because I've heard a lot of people say they, it's illuminated and they're driving in and from the town and you can just see it. It's just a perfect yeah. thing. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely just, wonderful. It really just enhances it. Okay, uh, let's see a couple other things. President Reagan came in 1987. Tell us a little bit about that visit. Did you, did you do around with him and did you keep in touch? President uh, Reagan, how did it how did uh, President happen? Reagan and I have a history. He offered me the Surgeon General's job for the United States, and I turned that down because I was committed here. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, since I knew him, I felt that it would be wonderful if he would come and he could meet his fraternity brothers here and he could uh, connect with the real people of the Midwest of America. He had a terrific time here, he really did. And we had some private time together. I talked to him for maybe half an hour, just the two of us. And uh, he also met the leading citizens of the town downstairs in the, in the conference room there in Mackey Arena. And he did a marvelous job. You know, later on we found out, of course, about his Alzheimer's disease. There was no trace of that. He was totally lucid and very sharp and uh, uh, right on point with all the questions he was asked and the answers he provided. Um, it was a, a real struggle to get the notion that we could get Air Force One onto our airport here. And they had to make a test flight and bring that huge airplane in here. But it was done. And uh, then he came and he couldn't bring his wife. There was some reason she wasn't able to come. The engineering schools provided a robot for him which talked. And you may have seen pictures of that. We had that come on stage. That was, didn't they give him that in, in uh, Mackey Arena? Or was that given to him before? Uh, we gave it to him. Maybe beforehand then. No, we gave it to him right there. That, that was the first time he saw it and he was fascinated by it and he said, could I take it home and show Nancy? And I told him it was a gift to him. And yes, he could take it home. And he brought all kinds of Purdue paraphernalia, like hats and shirts for his staff and whatnot. He had an absolute ball here. He was, was really was, happy to do really, it. I was able to go to the program that they had in Mackey, you know, which was really... And I know that they, he left his footmarks or the footprints over there in Michael Golden, and, they, and you can go over there and you know, see them. And uh, yeah. some of the people went by the next day and got their picture taken where President Reagan was. One of the things that I uh, wondered um, about this new Center for International Students, one time you were, one time you were thinking about that, a Center for International Students, or did that ever come to fruition or not? Uh, no, it really didn't. Uh, there are all kinds of, of reasons I read why things didn't come to, no, no. come to fruition. It's usually money. Uh, but we needed, uh, well, the Black Cultural Center did come to fruition. Yes. That was a dream that, that we had, and we wanted to make that happen. Right. And uh, we want to do something for Hispanic students, and that's happened. We want to do something for Muslim students, and that has happened. And uh, I thought international students would be a natural, but uh, uh, I'll give you a negative part of that. One time I invited to the president's house all the students from Africa, and they didn't come because they don't talk to each other. You know, there are different tribal uh, uh, animosities that go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So some came, some didn't come. And I realized it would be very difficult to have a true international center when you had those kinds of ancient rivalries that were extant. And uh, I did not avidly pursue that at that time. And we went rather for the others that have since come about. But I wouldn't... Uh, I uh, wouldn't put it out of the question, it could happen. And the Black Cultural Center, was that uh, funded by the, was that private funding or the state? No, it was private funding. Private funding? funding. Yeah. It's really added a, a big dimension. It's not lovely. And also the Latino, as you just mentioned. And some of the artifacts in the Black Cultural Center were my personal property that I had gathered in my travels and I'd gotten as gifts and uh, like the, uh, uh, the, the royal uh, stool that is in there and the uh, uh, beautiful garments that are there that were all part of what I had. Yes, I have been over there and I've seen them. They're really very nice. You yeah. had some of them in the, the house too before they built I had, the I had them in the house and I had them in my office, yeah, because mm -hmm. they were gifts from right. the person that just from over there. Okay. Um, athletics, um, one of the things that you were involved in was a selection of a coach, and you talked about athletics, and it really is key to the students and to the activity and to the life. Well, you know, I, I was terribly involved in athletics because I was chairman of the Big Ten for a good while. And uh, I was uh, on the NCAA board and I was involved with women in athletics nationally and equity and that kind of stuff. And 
uh, athletics reports directly to the president's office in the, in the way that the NCAA is organized. So I hired Morgan Burke, for example, which I think was one of my best appointments here. And I was directly involved with him in the identification and hiring of coaches, which is a very difficult undertaking. And uh, we've been very fortunate. I think Coach Tiller has been a terrific addition to our football program. And of course, our basketball program has been wonderful. And uh, uh, if we hadn't had some of those unfortunate events like uh, Ruth Jones having cancer and dying, who was such a fabulous coach. And Sharon Versip was one of her students, by the way. And, oh, yeah, she, I think so. uh, and she's here now, and I have great, great uh, expectations and hopes for her. She's a marvelous lady. Did you uh, bring involved with Carolyn Peck, too, when she Yes, retired? yes, yes, yeah. indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, uh, Jane and I both, uh, we went uh, to every football game home and away. We went to most basketball games. I couldn't get away to, to all of them at that one year when we made the pledge that we would be at every women's basketball game home and away. Uh, we did that. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we had the kids over to the house for dinners. I have never seen people eat more food than when we had the football team at the house for dinner. That, that was simply unbelievable. I mean, each of them had uh, a, like a serving plate instead of a dinner plate, and they would go back for seconds and thirds. <laughs> oh, dear. And we had all the teams, volleyball, and, uh, and well, I started, really started the soccer program here. I tried very hard to get uh, men's varsity soccer. And uh, we have this problem with the numbers game in the NCAA, that you have to keep matching the number of men and women that are in varsity sports. And uh, if we had uh, added men's soccer, we would have unbalanced things. So we added women's soccer as a varsity sport. But I still hope we can do men's soccer one of these days. Mm -hmm. Probably, yes. Then. Um one of the keys that university presidents are involved in is fundraising. And yes. Vision, yes, <laughs> Vision 21, which really exceeded its goal. Uh, any, can you just make some comments about the fundraising? It's a challenge every day, right? You know, there's no way that uh, a university like ours, which is a state institution, can expect to be funded by the state. It just costs too much to be competitive. and. We're living in the real world, in the real marketplace. We have to pay competitive salaries to everybody from janitors on up through the deans and the vice presidents. And there just isn't enough money to do that if you rely on either the state uh, allocation or on fees. Because if we charged what uh, it would take uh, to uh, have the student pay for it in fees, we'd be a private university. And instead of having an average cost for the last decade here has been $10,000 a year per student in-state. That's it's almost twice that for out-of-state. But the out-of-state student pays what a private school student would pay. He pays for everything that it really costs. And uh, even at that, it's a bargain because the competition, I have a granddaughter who's thinking of coming to Purdue next year, and she asked me uh, just last weekend at church, she says, what do you think about Vanderbilt or Northwestern? I said, I think very highly of them, but do you realize it costs eight times as much to go to school there as what we charge? And uh, that's the difference, $48,000 versus about uh, 10000 to to come here. And uh, uh, so the bottom line is you have to go out and raise money. You have to have foundation support. You have to have grant support for the faculty research. You have to have uh, a huge amount of donated funds for buildings and for special programs. International programs are involved in that. Uh, did you know we have a program in management which I helped start in Hanover, Germany? Mm -hmm. uh, this is almost totally paid for by a German foundation that we helped establish. And uh, uh, even with that, it's an expensive program for the students who are in it. It's taught by Purdue faculty from Cranach. They get the Purdue curriculum, they get a Purdue degree when they're finished, and they're ranked first in Europe in terms of quality. And they all have jobs long before they graduate with their MBA from Purdue. Uh, but it wouldn't be possible without private fundraising. And uh, that's true here, and I'm delighted that Dr. Jiski has been such a success in picking that up and uh, continuing that. 
a special professorships were a, a, a deal that I was very, very excited about and wanted to have more of, and Dr. Jiski agreed with that as well. Uh, one of the major donations I got for special professorships uh, came from George Goodwin. And you may have read recently that the Goodwin Endowment has been the matching funds for some 20 new professorships all over the institution. And uh, that started with a conversation at my house uh, with George Goodwin when he was still alive. He was a civil engineering graduate from here, and we'd become good friends over the years. And he said, what do you really need most of all? I had no idea he had any money, by the way. <coughs> and I told him that uh, donations for professorships and scholarships were probably number one on my list. And, uh, he said, well, I'm going to try to help you with that. And my goodness, did he ever. He, he gave us a huge sum of, of funds.